over and think, hi, Heather. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. I feel like we already made small talk, so. Yes. <laughs> um, I did my research on you, well, I mean, since we first connected. Right. But then last night I went and reviewed everything. So for those of you who don't know, Heather McCain is today's guest. And Heather is the executive director of Citizens for Accessible Neighborhoods and Disability Inclusion and Accessibility Consultant, or is that like one giant title? That's what I do through Citizens for Accessible Neighborhoods, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Heather is also a disability awareness instructor, was a deejer, deejer, DJ DJ <laughs> um, on CITR 101.9, the Saturday Edge program. Yeah. And... Paralympic torchbearer. Absolutely, I have it here if you want to see it. Yeah, <laughs> I so want to see that. So, um, talk to me about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? What is life? Um, I run Citizens for Accessible Neighborhoods, which is an organization I started in 2005. Um, I started it for multiple reasons. The main one was uh, I was in a power wheelchair full time at the time and I was having issues with the transportation in Maple Ridge and Pitt Meadows. Oh, were you at Maple Ridge? I was. Freaking, was it the 901? Yeah. Whatever that bus is that gets you out from Haney? That was right, 701. It's 701, what yeah. a shit, shit route. And it came once an hour to where I was and half of the time the bus drivers would say the ramps weren't working. This was the day of the, the three steps of the buses yeah. and so that, that ramp would come down and go down so slowly they would just lie and say that it wasn't working because they didn't want to deal with it. Uh, which pretty much screwed up any possibility of a life for me. And I had been so excited because I had been stuck in my house for about uh, th six years because at the age of 17 my body just kind of started to fall apart. And then I spent the next six years not leaving the house unless for a medical appointment. What happened? Um, we, well, it took a while to find out, but uh, I have a genetic mutation that I was born with. Uh, which is that the collagen in my body, the connective tissue, yeah. um, it is essentially not properly constructed. And so there's a term uh, double jointed, which is not actually correct, but a lot of people know what it is. But it means your joints are super wobbly and that's essentially um, what I had. So that combined with other genetic issues and I developed about five types of arthritis. And so essentially the first 17 years of my life and they were very rough because I was very athletic and very I was a speed freak and so I, I was not kind to my body but that uh, kind of accumulated and turned into arthritis quite early yeah. we knew that my body was different from other people because I was forever I mean I had friends who went skiing with me just because they liked to see my falls because my limbs would go every which way and it was oh, yeah. quite entertaining because I didn't bend like other people um, <laughs> And so we knew that there was stuff going on with my body and I was pretty much from the age of 17 to 17 had at least one cast a year, was just always injuring myself. And, um, and we, you know, we went to a couple doctors. Uh, I had one doctor when I was 15 who said, if you were a car, I'd send you back to the manufacturer and had no actual you know, helpful <laughs> information. Who would say that? The things I'm hearing about what doctors oh, say yes. sometimes? Yes, for sure. Ugh. And so, I mean, we had looked into it, um, but nothing came of it. And then uh, it wasn't actually until I was 23 and I requested all my medical files, which was definitely a couple trees. <laughs> and I went through it all. And I found out that when I was 12, a doctor had notated uh, that I had Ehlers-Danlos, which is a connective tissue disorder. I don't actually have Ehlers-Danlos, but I have a, a type of connective tissue disorder like it. That doctor didn't tell us. My doctor didn't follow up on it. Um, and so it's just one of those things that snuck through the cracks. Um, and I finally found a doctor who kind of put it all together and started figuring it out. And that's when I, I got into the wheelchair because by that time I couldn't walk very far at all. And, um, so yeah, I thought this wheelchair was going to be freedom, and then I went to get out on the bus, and the bus driver stopped. Um, and I had started a chronic pain support group out there because uh, it is very isolating when you have a disability, and they don't hand you a guidebook on how to be disabled. And so there's a lot of information that I needed, and the library books were very depressing. There were a lot of library mm -hmm. books about people with chronic pain being malingerers or doing it for attention 
or you know exaggerating there were actually there was one book that was super negative that I may have taken out and never returned because I didn't want anybody else <laughs> to read it at any point because um, you know it's, it's isolating and it's scary and then you read those books and you think oh my god like nobody understands this how am I gonna get any help how am I gonna change anything and um, so through the support group you know we were talking about this issue and, and I tried to get some organizations to help me and nobody was interested and I'd written letter after letter to TransLink with no reply. Um, and then I said, you know what, I wonder how hard it is to start up an organization. <laughs> that was like my favorite story that you shared when yeah. we talked on the phone. Yeah, so I'll, I'll let you finish, but I just really... Um, yeah, it's quite savvy and smart of you. Thank you. So yeah, so our first board was made up of the uh, people from the Chronic Pain Sport Group. Uh, and I wrote the exact same letter, but this time I put executive director at the bottom. And I got a reply within a week from TransLink. Um, and we worked on the issue out there and were able to uh, find out that they actually had a policy saying if the ramp wasn't operating, the drivers were to call the accessible taxi and the taxi was to take you, not just to where the bus was taking you, but to your final destination. Um, and so I was able to print this up and circulate it to people so that when the bus driver said it's not working, you could pull it out and say, you know, it is or it isn't. And they're supposed to check it at the beginning of each shift. And if they hadn't reported it, and then TransLink is charged for a taxi um, ride, they would definitely be followed up on and so this really helped with that situation um, and really kind of is a great example of what has continued since then with our organization which is access to information and and how sometimes just having information in your back pocket really gives you the power to be able to advocate for yourself um, and then once people found out that we had been able to do this, all of a sudden we had people <laughs> coming and saying, okay, now can you go to Canadian Tire because they have these swinging gates that don't open for people who have wheelchairs or can you go to this store because their hedges are over on the sidewalk and we can't get around mm. it or can you contact the city because of this? And so we just kind of started taking on uh, projects. And uh, I'd been involved with adaptive sports. I played power soccer and bocce and, and got funding to coach uh, power soccer, soccer and bocce team in um, Maple Ridge. Power soccer is uh, soccer for people with power wheelchairs. Yeah. And a larger ball. And then they put these uh, kind of, you know, at the time it was wood. It's a, a lot nicer plastic now but that you just kind of keep hitting the balls with and oh, cool. uh, it was a great team and through that one of the uh, one of the kids dads was a website developer and so we started a website for can and access to information was huge because yeah there's so many different resources but if you're not clued into the disability community or if you just don't know who to talk to it's hard to get that information and at the end of the day once you're done dealing with the medical system the last thing you want to do is, you know, go searching for information. And so we, yeah, we have an adaptive sports and rec page on there and we've got information about disability awareness and what is accessibility. Um, Cause we did a lot of education with that. And, you know, there's a lot of people who just legitimately don't know what accessibility is or assume that things are accessible. So what would that, what would that look like? Is it making everything quote unquote wheelchair accessible or what, what's, what's, what are businesses really missing? What's a trend that you see? Well, for me, it's really attitudinal accessibility um, because 93% of disabilities are invisible. 7% are visible. And of that 7%, you know, a percentage are people with mobility aids. And definitely physical accessibility is important. So making sure that someone with a mobility aid, a stroller, a shopping cart can get through the front door, mm -hmm. can get around the store, can get everywhere in their community. But also just how businesses interact with people with disabilities. First of all, questioning people who don't have a visible disability is a mm -hmm. huge one. Mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes they do have policies, do have services, do have resources, but they make you have to defend your disability and that is demoralizing and not everyone can do it, especially for yeah. people who it's fresh, they're still learning about it. Uh, you know, disability has so much stigma even now associated with it. 
um, and there's still, this is of people who self-identify as having a disability mm. as well. There's a lot of people who could benefit from disability resources, but because it's labeled disability, will not ever ask for it for themselves. Mm, I never even thought about it that way. And so having it where it's universally available to customers, period, and you don't have to explain and you don't have to fight for it. And then there's also ways that attitudinal accessibility can um, get around physical accessibility. So there was a deli in Maple Ridge and um, you know, they're, they're a small family deli. They couldn't afford the accessible door. Yeah. And of course, one of the big expenses of the accessible door is the maintenance and the upkeep. Because mm. uh, kids love that button and they hit it really, really hard. Encourage your kids to hit it a little softer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because often what happens is it breaks and the businesses don't replace it because it's so expensive. Nothing's worse because having a stroller for having a right. two-year-old for the past two years, I'm, it brought so much light to me being like, hey, this fucking door's broken. Yeah. Like, can, we, can we get on this? And there's al alternatives or I feel like people are very willing to help me because most people know the weight of a stroller right. with a kid in it, so they'll help you lug yeah. it upstairs. But there's certain places, you're, um, I went to Toronto, and because of all the snow in the winter, they have things that right. pull out yeah. in order to get up the stairs, but a lot of the businesses just didn't have them out. Right. So then I was stuck. I'm like, well, I'm not going to leave my kid outside. Yeah, exactly. So then I think, well, what about wheelchair accessibility in, like, in so many different ways where we do fail as exactly. a society? Yeah, and so what their solution was, it was to put a doorbell on the front door. Okay. Um, and they said, if you need the door open, you press the doorbell and staff will come. But eventually it got to the point where anybody who was close to the door would open it, whether it's staff or customers. Um, and it was such a nice way of saying, hey, we want to help you, mm. but we have our own limitations. Mm. Um, and, you know, we can put in something that is not perfect but it will, it's better than what's currently is. Um, or Power River did a, an assessment of their downtown area and the businesses found out whether they were accessible or not and how they could improve. And some of the small shops just couldn't be accessible. Um, but what happened was when we had the BC Disability Games there, you could go downtown and they would be standing at their front door and they would be ready to serve you. So if you needed something to be brought to you or if the store next door had a change room that you could get to, you could take, you know, something next door. They had already thought about having staff at the door to be able to talk to you and see if there was anything that was of interest in their shop. And yes, you couldn't physically go in, but they would, you know, come back and forth to the door. And again, not perfect, not ideal. Um, but it showed that they were aware mm -hmm. of the issue, that they still wanted you as a customer, um, and that they were willing to do a little work in order to do that. And, you know, that goes a long way, um, because I think a, lo a lot of people with disabilities feel unseen, or they feel seen, but they're a burden. Mm -hmm. That's that's how society kind of treats us, is we're often, we don't get accessibility because it has a cost, but it's like that cost is more important than your ability to get about your community. Yeah. And so whether they actually say the word burden or not, they're communicating it in, in many ways. Um, sidewalks are a huge thing. The surfaces of sidewalks. Uh, we've often cities pick aesthetics over accessibility. Um, the the uh, Olympic Village is a perfect example of an area that has six different surfaces, none of which are <laughs> great for for wheels. They've got small little bricks and they've got yeah. wood that if they had been put in the path of travel, the opposite way that they are, you wouldn't be going over the lines. Um, and so it's, it's things like that where, um, you know, they wanted it to look a certain way. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately it's causing issues, especially in Vancouver where people in wheelchairs and mobility aids and strollers are then going into the biking lane because the biking lane is nice and flat and smooth and the cyclists are understandably not liking that the slower traffic that they have to dodge are going into that lane but the walking lanes are actually uncomfortable for people in mobility aids and strollers and that so every line every crack you see in the in the sidewalk that's another kind of shot to the back of someone that's in a chair um, and uh, and that can be quite a bit depending on what the injury or disability is. You are within the first couple of minutes opening <laughs> my eyes to so many different things. There's something that you said 
around um, needing to explain your disability. Right. And like needing to like almost prove it in a way. Absolutely. For you, you're in a wheelchair and you're also not. I have a, a power chair that power I chair. use for the longer days. I have a, a specialized walker that uh, I had some friends uh, change. <laughs> I created a design uh, and was able to get them to, to do that for me. And then sometimes I'm not. Yeah. Um, and that is very confusing for people. Um, I was in a wheelchair pretty much full time for about 12 years. Um, and then my spinal arthritis got really bad. And so those cracks in the sidewalks and the lines um, were quite difficult. So now I kind of say, okay, you know, is it gonna be a bad knee day or is it gonna be a bad back day? And mm. I balance things. Um, also, sometimes I use my power chair more for the fact that it's a comfortable chair in long meetings. Um, my worst arthritis is actually in my collarbones. And if my arms are down too long, unsupported, I can lose the use of my arms. Um, and so going to meetings that are eight hours with chairs that have no armrests and- They're gonna say with no idea what they're doing. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to those, but, <laughs> but arm no armrests and no tables to put your arms on. Yeah. Um, I, I would last only about an hour before I lose the use of my arms, which is not convenient uh, in, in meetings. So, you know, sometimes I take my chair more for my arms than my legs and, um, and yeah, it can be confusing. I remember, uh, one of the times that I was out front gardening here and one of the kids who had known me for the three years I lived here and was in the, the wheelchair full time went running home and said, Heather's cured, Heather's cured. <laughs> Because that's the understanding of disability. You're either in the chair or you're not. And that in between is very confusing to people, but there's a lot of different disabilities, uh, multiple sclerosis, arthritis, um, where you are in and out. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's, you know, it's interesting because just recently, actually, I went over to Victoria and had a horrible experience on transit where I had taken my walker and I was staying for a week and so I had multiple bags and wasn't able to kind of flip the walker up onto the bus uh, and right. so the bus pulled up and I said I need the ramp and she shook her head uh, and I said I need the ramp um, and she shook her head again uh, and then she said pull because we happened to be near a light pole and I, I said okay just pull ahead because if she'd put down the ramp uh -huh. there wouldn't have been enough room. Uh, instead, she put it down, and sure enough, there was no room, so she put it back up, and I said, okay, pull forward and put down the ramp, and she said no. And by this time, there's a huge crowd around me, and they're all wanting to get on the bus, and they don't know what's going on. So eventually, she does pull forward, and I get on, and, uh, you know, I've, I've just traveled from Vancouver. I'm already kind of exhausted, so I didn't say anything, and then... I get to my stop and there are buttons on the bus for people who sit in the accessible seating that indicates that the people who use the ramps are getting off. Mm -hmm. So she heard the special button that says that I was getting off uh, and she just sat there. And I said, would you please put down the ramp? And she said, no. And I said, you know, I just, I was so frustrated. So I just asked the question again. She pressed the button and the ramp was about at a 90 degree angle when I, I said to her, um, you know, people shouldn't have to fight this hard for access, and she stopped it, and she just sat there, and the ramp is now 90 degree angle, and I'm just wanting to get off. Did nobody else stop or intervene or support? No, nope. nope. uh, at that point, there wasn't a lot of people on the bus. Um, so I said, look, just, you know, can you let me off the bus? Let me off the fucking bus. Yeah, I was trying to be polite because I knew I was going to write a complaint letter and it's always best ah. when you're polite, even though in my head I was like, Arr. um, and, uh, so she put it down and once I was on it and knew it couldn't go back up, I was like, you know, nobody should have to fight for the access that's literally built into this bus. Um, and she said, it wasn't made for you. It was made for wheelchairs. Um, and I, I was like, okay, this is not a woman who's going to learn from this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to waste my time. I, I continued on. Um, and it was very frustrating and a perfect example of attitudinal accessibility. At the end of the day, the bus 
drivers are still the gatekeepers to the ramp. Mm. Um, and if you have someone who, like that, for whatever reason, doesn't feel that you fit uh, who should be using it, um, and the policy is for both BC Transit and TransLink, if a passenger needs the ramp, you put it down, whether they have a visible disability or not. It can be a senior, it can be someone who doesn't look like they need it, you just put it down. Um, and unfortunately, it's experiences like that that really, you know, hit home for me because a lot of our work has been transportation. It's what mm -hmm. we started on, it's what we continue to do. And that is a perfect example of something where some people had that experience once and never go on the bus again. And that's where people think, oh, okay, you can just let that roll off your shoulder, you know, or, or it was just one time, it was just one bus driver. But, you know, for a lot of people, just going with a mobility aid outside is putting a giant spotlight on you. And they even have one spot in the buses where you're facing the rest of the passengers because you go in backwards. Yeah. And so there's people who won't even use that because you're essentially watching people watching you. And it's already intimidating to use the transit system for some people. And I mean, I'm an advocate. I have been doing it since 2005, 14 years. And the last thing I wanted to do in that moment was advocate for myself. I was mm -hmm. tired. I just wanted to get to my friend's place, um, you know, but I said something because I really believe that you need to address it in the situation. But I totally understand it when people do not say something in the situation because it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. And that was just, you know, that's a, an example that people can hear and instantly connect with. But there's so many more microaggressions throughout the day that happen that exhaust you. And you have to explain yourself and you have to... And so, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, I've even had people who have contacted me within the disability community who don't think I should be uh, representing people with disabilities without having a visible disability anymore at some conferences. So, you know, there's even... Oh, yeah. Well, it's just like still with racism within yeah. my minor groups of other cultures thinking less of others. Absolutely. And it's, I, I mean... I'm neither disabled or a minority mm -hmm. by any means, but yeah, it's just like that internal yeah. conflict even more. Well, and the minorities are the majority, and so you would hope mm. that, at least in Vancouver, you would hope that we were doing better. Yeah. And I mean, my mom, my mom's first roommate uh, was is was a quad. She passed away two weeks ago. Oh, but, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Thank you. I so I grew up with Gail, and she was in a wheelchair. Um, and I think that was extremely helpful for me because, um, well, and actually when I transitioned into the wheelchair, I went and spent three weeks with her and her husband and it really helped because she built this great life for herself. Yeah. Um, and when she had the car accident, essentially her family wanted to put her in an institution. They said it had a nice arts and crafts program for her, which was never her thing. <laughs> and she, she was very much like me. She was a very strong, opinionated woman who loved speed and just living life to the fullest. Yeah. Um, and so to think that that would content her, you know, but because she had a disability that her life was essentially over. Um, instead, she put herself through university. She married the handy dart driver. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and then she, you know, she worked for the government for decades yeah. and created this life for herself that was great. Um, and that, I think, really helped me. I was unusual in that my family had friends who had disabilities, had friends who were gay. You know, I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and it wasn't something that I didn't know anything about. You also grew up in Maple Ridge. Okay. Well, yes. <laughs> Well, and I mean, I, you know, and that's something where I had some friends in Maple Ridge who, who just disappeared from my life once I was in a wheelchair, um, including one who, to her credit, at least face to face, had the conversation with me, but said, I can't be seen in public with someone who's in a wheelchair. Um, and so, yeah, there is a, a lot of uh, issues and Maple Ridge is a little slower sometimes than other communities. I only say that because like I grew up in Coquitlam and Pogo, right, but yeah. and no offense to anyone or yourself yeah. from Maple Ridge, it's just easy to rag on Maple Ridge, you know. <laughs> it is. Yeah. What um when 
you spoke about Gail. Yeah. Um, it sounds like she really took you under her wing. She, it was more just that I saw that life continues. Yeah. You know, we didn't even talk about the disability much uh, or the wheelchair. It was just mm-hmm. seeing how happy she was uh, with Miguel and with the life that they created for themselves. And, um, and so, yeah, it wasn't even that we kind of talked about disability or talked about her experiences. It was just that I saw life does not end like mm. so many people. I mean, I went to some support groups that scared the shit out of me. They were, you know, older women who were like, my life is over. They were having like the bitter Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it just like, this happened to me at 17, essentially, I'd worked my ass off to graduate because I'd actually skipped so much that I had to do two years of school and one to graduate on time. Um, I was two paychecks away from buying a truck and doing a six month trip across BC, which I then used to live on until I could get on disability. Uh, And every time I had to use money out of that fund for something other than that trip, it killed me. Um, But I injured myself uh, in the summer after graduation and within six months I had to quit a job I love, I had to quit school, I had to quit work, sports, everything and and yeah it was it, you know just a total mind fuck. I mean it was it was I had no idea what was going on with my body, what was going on with my life and the reason I didn't leave the house very often was because people would say to me oh but you had such potential. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> And so it was frustrating because that's what I heard over and over again. Like, okay, your potential is gone. You know, your your life is over. Um, and so with Gail, it was just, it was that, no, it wasn't. You know, yeah. there there are ways to work around this. There are ways to work with it. Um, and growing up, she'd never been Gail in the wheelchair. She was just Gail. Yeah. And I think that really helped as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, and she passed away in her late 60s. Um, and so... You know, she lived the life that she wanted. Uh, She would have, I'm sure there were things that she would have liked to do, but she made the most with what she had. Um, And she and Miguel were just as in love as they ever were. And um, fortunately, uh, just two years ago, um, I, my sister and I went and uh, because they moved back to Chile, which Miguel was from. And uh, so we went and spent three weeks with them. In Chile? In Chile, yeah. How amazing was that? And we had a great time there. And it was so nice because we had such a good visit. Um, And it's nice to have since she's passed away. And actually my sister uh, passed away just a month after that trip. Um, And so it's it's a, you know, a trip I hold very dear for having that time with both of them. Yeah. Um, You know, not all of us get to have something that you can just so tangibly remember uh with someone that you've lost and uh, as much as we love it to be less expensive so we could go hug miguel (laughs) uh it's just nice to know that we made the trip and we were able to and and yeah we visited almost you know every other year they lived in calgary and and so no it was great to have that influence um and uh, and she was really interested in kind of the disability politics and and where things were going and and whether there was progress or not and how slow some progress was and Mm. um because yeah and i have had people who have come up to me um and this is the years into running my organization and said you know wouldn't it be better if you were in an institution where there's people who can look after you and there's programs for you and they're not asking out of you know any malicious intent or they they really are curious like isn't that what people with disabilities are supposed to be for? And Mm. if you think about it, we've only been out of the basements and the institutions for about 30 years. Yeah. And so there's still a lot of people who are surprised. My my brother-in-law had been with my sister for about five months when he very bravely decided to go on a a three-week trip with us um, to Waterton National Park. And uh, Where's that? It's uh, just on the border of Montana and Alberta. Cool. Beautiful park. And um, we went, I was in the wheelchair, and we went, and he was shocked by how many people came up to me to congratulate me for being out. And it was interesting because I, it really made me realize how used to it I have become to Mm. when I, 
And I use my my power chair like an ATV, so I'm out on trails, <laughs> and I'm out all over the place. But we'd have people who would come up and say, it's nice to see you out. Isn't it great that you get to, you know, have these uh, date trips? Uh, and, you know, again, the intent is not bad. Yep. And if it was just the one person who said it that day, then it's, you know, you're just like, okay, that's that one person. But it's again and slide. again and yeah. again. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, it was interesting because you do these comments you hear, um, which is definitely something that I'd like people to think about is how they approach people with disabilities. First of all, assumptions. I think the one story that sticks with me the most of experiences is being in Yale town and having a fellow come up to me and say, I lost my job today. I went home to tell my partner and found her in bed with our neighbor and she kicked me out and broke up with me and I was thinking of ending my life but I saw you over here in your wheelchair smiling and I thought if she can live I can live too and you know having mental health issues myself I didn't in any way want to <laughs> be like mean or <laughs> say anything that might make him change his mind but I you know, it's it's the fact that he would see someone in a in a wheelchair and automatically have an assumption about how horrible my life is, see me smile without knowing anything about myself, and just assume that I'm being brave and inspirational and two words by the way that you shouldn't apply to people with disabilities. <laughs> I just I'm so like I think that people say brave and they really mean something kind, but the, like, the times that I've used it or even to other people, I'm like, is this really the right word that I sh like, yeah. I think there's just like, we'd be brave. You're like, bitch, I'm just, do I'm just living. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, and that's the thing, you know what, if, if you want to cite particular accomplishments, mm. by all means, you know, you, if there's still words that are, yeah, you know, kind of iffy, but... If you're just congratulating me for getting out of bed in the morning, it is kind of condescending. And it does show that the value of a person with a disability is less than, that the assumption is those who have made it have overcome their disability, another term that's often used in newspaper articles about Paralympic athletes or professionals who have disabilities, they'll say we overcame our disability when really no we live with our disability it's a part of ourselves just like other parts my kitten has arrived in the room to Yay! sniff out the the equipment here nikita's making her podcasting debut yes <laughs> hi nikita she's still doing like the low crouch thing yeah okay let's talk about language sure. let's talk about that because um i remember i got in flack one time um at one of my old jobs because i said the handicap washroom mm. and someone's like mm -mm, mm -mm. and I'm like okay and I'm like but but why or like what is it like yeah. what's PC what's not what are things to say what's you know what and of course there's no malintent and yeah. we need to be educating ourselves on what is not offensive right. to say well first of all I want to say that people with disabilities are not a group of people who have all shared <laughs> Mm -hmm. commonalities and so that means that what I'm about to tell you is uh, very generalized Great. but it doesn't apply to everyone and essentially if someone says I don't like that term please use this one use it with them um, but handicap is old-fashioned Gail continued to use it for her entire life because it's what she grew up with mm. um, and she didn't see any harm in it being used however it today what the handicap refers to is not actually the person, but the barrier that parking or the bathrooms can create. So if a building has stairs, I'm handicapped by the stairs. Mm. So it's not necessarily about the person. Um, and so handicap is still used for the bathroom and the washrooms, but it shouldn't really be applied to people. To people, yeah. saying you're handicapped. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and there's two different ways to refer to people with disabilities. I mean, there's three. One is their name, which is always the, <laughs> the best. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I scared and, her. Yeah. Sally. Sally Kitty. Um, but there's, there's a person first and identity first. So person first is when you put the person before the disability. So you don't say disabled person or arthritic person. You say person with a disability or person with a with arthritis. And the reason for this is um, the belief is that we need to concentrate on the fact that a person with a disability is a person. Now, the fact that it's 2019 and I have to teach this and disability awareness seminar still makes me choke because we should be well past this, mm -hmm. um, but we're not. And so for some people, they really do believe that making sure we use language that reflects the fact that people with disabilities are people, have the same wants and needs um, and access as everyone else is something that should be embedded right within the language. Mm -hmm. And there's people who have a disability but not are, are their disability. And so it's a part of them, but it's not the whole of them. And so they want that to be recognized by not being a disabled person. Um, because, you know, there's lots of identities that are part of a person. You don't go around saying, oh, this is my divorced friend or, you know, it's yeah. not how we start other parts of a person's identity. And so to use it for disability kind of puts more of an emphasis on disability. Uh, identity first is using disabled, is using arthritic, is using terms that just Put it out there and say this is part of my identity mm -hmm. you cannot take my disability away from my identity it is a part of my identity um, the autistic community mm -hmm. uses it uh, you don't typically say people with autism you say autistic person um, okay. and there's other communities that are beginning to use it more it's kind of making a bit of a comeback but I would say generally Person first is the best place to start. And if someone says disabled, don't say, oh, well, that's not correct. Okay. Because there are two different ways of thinking about it. Typically, though, as much as it's good to know the terminology, in conversations with people with disabilities, you don't actually say people with disabilities that often. You use their name. You use their pronouns. Mm -hmm. you, um, and so it's not something that comes up a lot. But if you're at work and you're talking about policies... Uh, for inclusion in that, then it's good to use people first unless, you know, otherwise told. Um, and that's the thing too, is that like any group that has been pushed to the margins, um, there is no one answer for the entire group because yeah. we are not a community of like-minded, <laughs> completely individuals. We are individuals and, and people are at different places in their kind of their experience with disability so mm -hmm. there are still people who you can look at and you can go okay well that person has a disability who don't self-identify as having a disability um, and I've had this conversation I was talking to someone who um, has quite a bit of troubles walking she can you know barely get from the car to the store she can't do stairs but she does she so she says she has mobility impairments but she's not disabled and I asked her to break that down for me and explain it. And by the end of the conversation, she was like, yeah, I guess I have a disability. But unfortunately, disability is a bad word still in society. Mm -hmm. It's a negative. And that's where I'm at. Disability is not inherently a negative word. It's what people's perception of disability has done to it. And so nobody should be afraid to say disability. It shouldn't mean more than the fact that People have something that uh, affects their ability to go about their everyday life, which is what disability, the definition of disability is. Um, technically, people who are pregnant are, you know, have a disability if they can't bend down or if they can't walk as far or, you know, and there's lots of people who have uh, disabilities that may be short term or just in intermittent from, uh, you know, construction workers, backs and knees and that sort of thing, which mm -hmm. they may not term as a disability but it affects their ability to go about their daily life. Um, and this is the thing, you know, 
essentially nobody gets through life without having a disability at some point. It may be a broken arm, it may be short term, it may be something like epilepsy where it comes and goes, um, and it may be something that's completely controlled by medication. Uh, and so it doesn't affect your, your daily life, but it is something that you have to uh, keep under control. And so there's lots of different types of disability as well. And that's definitely one of the frustrations within the disability world is, well, you know, if a city puts in an accessible playground, first of all, they only assume that the people with disabilities using it are kids. They don't think about the parents that have disabilities or the grandparents or the you know nannies or daycare mm -hmm. providers who may have, so they have it so that small wheelchairs can get on certain things, but they don't think about the larger wheelchairs. Mm. Or they only think about wheelchairs, um, and they don't think about people who are blind, who have hearing impairments, who are autistic, who have mental health issues. Um, as a child, I, I was always very sensitive to noises and lights, um, and so a lot of what is now being provided for families of kids with autism uh, would have been great for me because I had to stay away from playgrounds. They were just too much chaos, too many people, too loud. And now some playgrounds are having these quieter little sections. So how would it, how would the government or how would like a city council, um, like I feel like there's so, like the spectrum is so yeah. wide for being able to provide accessibility, whether it be physical, mental, mm -hmm. or there's just so many different ways that they'd have to do it. Do you feel like, and I, I ask this fully transparently, do you think the pendulum swung so far that we need to try and make access to everyone that it's almost like easier for people to step back than to actually do it? Um, I, I don't think that's how it is, but I think it's sometimes how people feel. Yeah. Um, so I do think that often people don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And so they they think, okay, well, if we start with addressing the needs of people who are blind, what if we have, um, you know, clients who are deaf and they come and say, well, why didn't you help us? And I say, if you can do anything to improve accessibility, improve it and kind of work at it as you can. But businesses and government, there are ways that they can make it accessible for multiple groups and that's where universal access comes in because essentially there are a lot of things that when accessible for one group become accessible for other groups curb cuts are an excellent example what curb cuts so when you are on a sidewalk yep and you're gonna take your stroller down ah, so it's a smoother transition it's the smoother transition it's not having your daughter's yep. son, daughter yep. you know just kind of like pushing her off the edge of the sidewalk and having her <laughs> smack down. There are a few like that. Yes, I'm like, there geez, are. Like, I'm sorry, little one. But yeah. when a curb cut is done properly, um, it will have cut lines in it in the direction of travel so that a wheelchair's wheels are not going over it, but are going with it. Mm -hmm. But the cut lines are there for people who are blind so that if they have a cane, they can know where the sidewalk is about to end and the road is about to begin. Um, and that is then universally accessible for people who are blind, for people who have mobility aids, for people with strollers, for people who are unable to lift their leg up or down, mm -hmm. um, for people who have balance issues, so going on that one leg is, is a little iffy. Um, and there are a lot of ways that cities and government can put in things that make it universally accessible. And so it may still not cover every group, but there are definitely ways. And we have concentrated very much on physical accessibility for a long time. Uh, and so there are other groups that are coming forward and saying, hey, what about us? Mm -hmm. um, deaf community is definitely a big one, although I wanna put a, a disclaimer here that the deaf community does not consider themselves to have disabilities. So they do not see themselves as part of the disability community. They're able-bodied people who can't hear um, and so they don't necessarily see themselves as part of the disability community, even though when it comes to access issues, cities, government will put them kind of in the same basket. Okay. But as far as their community is concerned, they have their own language, they have their own culture, they are yeah, their own yeah. people, and so it's, it's different. Um, but, for example, closed captioning on movies. 
they there's equipment at theaters that is hardly ever works uh, when it's available when someone knows where it is um, that's quite cumbersome that also really puts a spotlight on them because they have to have it hanging out of their drink cup so that they can read the closed captioning for movies whereas if movies just had closed captioning <laughs> You know, it's one of those things, A Quiet Place, the movie that came out last year, which was about... Um, a, uh, there oh, yeah, they, could, they couldn't say anything, otherwise things would get them. Yeah, there was only three lines of dialogue in the entire movie. Um, because, really? Yeah, because there was um, there were these something that uh, could attack people based on sound, and so they had to stay completely silent. And this one family was succeeding at it because they happened to have a daughter who was deaf, and so they signed, and so they were doing a little bit better than some other families. And that movie had closed captioning for the signing. And, you know, it was interesting because people have been told again and again, nobody's going to pay to go see a movie with closed captioning. And that did so well at the mm. box office. Um, and was a good example of people get used to things. You know, there's a lot of accessibility that surrounds us that you don't think of as being accessible. Um, and that's that's a big part of universal accessibility. If we had wider hallways, if we had wider doors, then it doesn't matter whether you have a stroller or a mobility aid, you know, you can just get in. Aging in place is a huge thing as well. Like if we did just some things like, um, in order to have a grab bar in a bathroom, you need to have proper support behind the wall if you put that proper support which is essentially you know wood if you put that in when you're building it what that costs versus someone needing it down the road and having to rip out the wall put it in put the wall back and then yeah. put the grab bar is huge trying to get uh people who are doing those projects to take on those small costs in the beginning are very difficult mm. um, to have flat entrances where nobody has to step up uh, we have a lot of stores in Vancouver that have one what we call the one-step stop yeah 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 it's and so true it's one step and it means that there's a lot of people who just can't access it yeah I feel like that's a lot in Gastown yeah there's so much gravel Gastown. island oh yeah 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 the market itself is is not too okay. bad but the small small stores yeah. yeah like the broom shop and stuff exactly yeah. i want to go back to curb card mm -hmm. curb, curb cut. cuts curb cuts it makes me think of um quick cuts right like the little haircut <laughs> place um if people are listening to this and they're in vancouver is there any distinct spots where it's so obvious it's a curb cut that you would be like this is a spot um that not, they could go and like find not that i can think of but i'll tell you some things to look for um what a curb cut is supposed to be is that it is directly lined up with a crosswalk so that if I walked off the curb cut I would immediately be in the crosswalk mm -hmm. and if I continued to walk straight I could then go up the next curb cut that's very rarely the case um, it should also have two separate curb cuts per curb for the two directions you could travel so you could either go straight or say you could go to the right. Um, we have rounded curb cuts because the city likes to save money. And what that is, is they've just rounded off mm -hmm. the corner of it. This is difficult for people who have visual impairments or are blind because it doesn't help them orient themselves to the crosswalk. I might just walk out into freaking traffic well, down the middle like in Japan. And we have had that, yeah, in... Um, in Maple Ridge, there were a couple instances where people got hit by vehicles because they went into the middle of the road instead of being able to orient themselves by the curb cuts. Curb cuts should also, the cut line should be, as I say, the, the path of travel, which is if someone's in a wheelchair and is going down the curb cuts, the curb, the cuts should go with the wheels mm. so the wheels aren't going bum, 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 bum over them. Got it. Um, and also... We have, especially downtown Vancouver, we have areas where there's just one curb cut, and in order to go the opposite direction, you have to go into oncoming traffic to then go around. Mm. Um, and so yes, this becomes quite dangerous. Or the other issue is that people don't stop at the stop line and block the curb cut with their car, especially if they're going to turn right. Yeah. Um, and one more 
service announcement for curb cuts <laughs> is for pedestrians to stand back from them because often pedestrians will block a curb cut yeah. by standing on them and so people who are coming from the opposite side of the road can't actually get up because people are in the way um, and unfortunately because when you're in a wheelchair you are below eye level people mm -hmm. often don't see you and yeah. then by the time you get their attention they think why is this person being so aggressive <laughs> they're like hi please make room for me um, yeah. my friend Justine um, who's been on the podcast and um, three times oh yeah she is incredibly smart and she actually had a very specific question for you okay and I feel like being smart and having a great question aren't correlation, but whatever. Um, and she wanted to ask, when you have your, I was going to say powerhouse, when you have <laughs> your power wheels or your walker, yeah. do you find it's an extension of yourself? And have you, what, what is a reaction that you get when people either touch it or try and move it without your permission? Excellent question. Um, a mobility aid and this includes dogs, it includes white canes, which are for people who are blind, it includes walkers, wheelchairs, they are an extension of the person. They are part of our bubble, <laughs> you know, they're part of our, our private space, and so they aren't something that you should touch without asking. One issue is um, people move people in manual chairs around like they were furniture. So if you're in a manual chair and somebody thinks you're in their way, instead of asking you to move, they will just push you. But mobility aids aren't light. Like they're heavy. No, but if you don't have the brakes on for uh, a manual chair, yeah, yeah. They can get at least a little bit until the person is able to brake. When they try and move my power chair, which is a couple hundred pounds, they get it I hear an oof <laughs> as they hit it. Um, I have been to concerts where people have used my walker for their drinks, their coats, their cigarettes, um, their feet. I Ew. Yeah. Um, and so yes, uh, I've had people try to, you know, move me in my chair. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely something, and the same with guide dogs and service dogs. Yeah. You should not touch them. You should not ask to touch them because that puts the person in an uncomfortable position. If they say no, then not everyone reacts well to that, and do they want to go through that? If they say yes, they're encouraging something that they shouldn't be encouraging. Um, so you just shouldn't touch a dog that is working, and it, it is difficult. I have been in meetings where it's you know, a, a disability committee, and there's five dogs in the room, one on either side of me, and I've sat on my hands sometimes and knees, because sometimes the dogs are friendly, sometimes they just lay on the floor, but it's important. I mean, it is the difference between those dogs being able to save someone's life or not. Mm. If you have distracted a dog that is supposed to be aware of, a, a, you know, diabetes or epilepsy or something, so they're supposed to be paying attention to the person that they're with. If you distract them in that moment, it can have dire consequences. And it's hard because they're cute. And, oh, and, they're, and they're just so well behaved. Well, I mean, they're trained yeah. professionals, but I'm like, oh, just want to exclude yeah. you. And the other thing, too, is if you ask and you get a no, don't assume the person is blind and so that means they won't see you pet their dog. <laughs> because that happens. No. Yes. No, yeah. really? Yeah, they don't get the answer that they want, so they still do it. And the thing is, there are people who are blind who can't see at all, and there are people who have, uh, either they're blind or they have vision impairments, which means that they have some sort of sight. And so it doesn't mean that they can't see you do it. Um, and so this is the thing that often happens, is that we're not given agency over our own bodies. Mm. Um, and whether it's that somebody asks, whether they can pet a dog and get an answer they don't like so they do it anyways or whether somebody in a chair doesn't want to move for someone and so they move you anyways um it's often the case or you know when I would go to listen to music and have the walker off to the side to come back to people's drinks being on it um and 
I've only ever run over someone once on purpose. No, you didn't. You have to tell me. Yes, and it was a politician. It was at the uh, Paralympics, <laughs> and we were at a uh, at a fancy you know event in the evening and uh, free champagne and all that kind of stuff. And he kept leaning on my chair, and this was not a person I had met before that night. Certainly not a person I voted for. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, kept leaning on my chair. Uh, I said, you know, please don't touch my chair. It's an extension of myself. He would, I had a tray on my chair. He would put his drink on it. Um, you know, I asked about five times. Uh, and then I just went right over his foot and he stayed away from me for the rest of the night. <laughs> um, but it is, it's frustrating because you have people yeah. who, and you know, what's incredible, what, what always shocks me, and I'd love to actually attach a video to my chair one day and do this, going into Metrotown, which I live near, people, I, I can be in a chair that's 500 pounds and I'm not a small person myself either, and be in this chair and I'm invisible because I'm below eye line. And so people will walk into me and then yell at me for driving erratically, um, which is a big thing. And uh, yeah, and so it's it's interesting. And, and just the comments you get. One of the biggest challenges as a person with a visible disability mm -hmm. are the cures that people offer us. Please don't offer people cures. <laughs> I really hope that my listeners are smarter than that. I would hope so too, but yes, the amount of people who have asked to pray over me, lay hands on me, give me cures. I've had people who have said, have you tried physio? And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, 20 years of having chronic pain and I've never once thought of that. Thank you. You've just fixed everything. <laughs> um, I had a woman at the Vancouver Art Gallery who followed myself and my friend for two hours the entire exhibit just following us around trying to get me to try some sort of there was alkaline water that had something added to it and she, eventually she just yelled at me uh, you just don't want to get better and stormed off um, and this is not an occurrence like once a month this is when I go out with my mobility aids this is gonna happen and it's part of why some days to the detriment of my energy and my body and my pain, I decide not to go out with a mobility aid. It's because some days I just don't have it in me to deal with that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's difficult because I think when you have a disability, and the only other example I can think of is when you're pregnant, people think they have some sort of ownership over your health information. How many, like, you've already mentioned it, but the amount of unsolicited advice I would get. Yeah. Or people telling me what my body looked like, mm -hmm. saying, that's a boy in you, that's yeah. a girl. And you've got a, you know, sonogram that says you've got a girl, and, and they're like, nope, no, it's a boy. It's 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 high. It's to the side. It's... That's exactly what would happen over yeah. and over again, because I was working in retail, right? right? So I was very customer-faced. Yeah. Um, and when my baby was growing, she wasn't growing very big at mm. first and I also like I'm tall and I'm right. fairly fit so I didn't get a right. huge bump so the comments would also be oh like you're so small or for other people who I know who had like larger babies yeah. and their stomachs expanded differently stomachs the uteruses mm -hmm. um the, the amount of unsolicited people yeah. telling you and people like telling you what's what's going on in your body yeah or, so. or another example is that I watched my sister um, who had a boy mm -hmm. who was stillborn um, after Caleb was born she still looked pregnant and she'd have people coming up to her and being like you're gonna have a girl it's this or it's that or you know and it was brutal to watch and just like when you have a disability, you go through this thing of, do I tell the person? Do I not tell the person? Um, I, because repetitive motions um, feed into my, the arthritis in my collarbones, um, and too much repetitive motions means I lose the use of my arms, I shave my head. And so I get a lot of oh, comments about yeah. cancer. And it's this very uncomfortable thing where it's people who have, usually it has nothing to do with me. They have a personal story they want to share. But I'm stuck in that position of, do I tell them 
I don't have cancer and they feel horrible about the misunderstanding or the assumption and then they go away just you know kind of going after themselves for having put themselves in that situation or do I lie which I'm first of all not very good at but or just go along with it so that they can get it out oh my gosh. but then I'm put in that position of being like I don't want to represent myself as having something that I don't because nobody should represent themselves as having something as they don't yeah. and so it's this it's back and forth but yeah I mean it was really hard for me to get used to the comments when I the, I had a scooter first mm -hmm. when I was in Maple Ridge and I could only use the scooter itself so I didn't go very far but I could get to downtown um, and because I was 17 I would have people who would tell me you shouldn't steal your gra grandparents scooter like this isn't fun and games you know or I'd have store people who wouldn't allow me into the store but would allow seniors and you get these comments and I'd hear people who were saying like oh she's faking or oh she's lazy or this and in the beginning because I didn't know what was going on with my body I took that all in you know and it really screwed me up and it took a long time to learn to not take on any of those comments and to get to the point where I didn't hear all of them too um, but that's a long process and not everyone gets there and so or those comments could break someone absolutely right yeah and I mean you know that's the thing is that I went around everywhere I went people questioned the validity of my disability even when it was visible <laughs> You know, even when I had something that showed that. And and when I started using the buses, I mean, the amount of people, because I'm stuck there, I can't move around on the bus, would go, what's wrong with you? First of all, having a disability is not something that's wrong. So just the way the question is set up to yeah. begin with is... Look at his face. <laughs> and so, yeah, I have to... We're good. I have to kind of go through this. Do I want to educate people today? And... It'd be fine if it was the one person, mm -hmm. but I had days where I would count and it'd be like 14, 15 people who are saying what's wrong with you and, uh, you know, can you walk, can you not, asking these really personal questions. And yeah, there's people who are like newly disabled. Um, I talked to a couple of people who had not come to terms with their spinal cord injury and if you ask them, it was traumatizing for them. Mm -hmm. They were still trying to figure it out themselves. And also, through those questions and the way they were voiced, you heard what people thought about disability. Because you're something that is awaiting a fix, which I think, you know, we need to talk about. Because I know, well, there's, there's a lot online about these, you know, the robotic legs and things that are giving people with spinal cord injuries the opportunity to walk again. There are people with spinal cord injuries who don't think about walking again. And that may be difficult for people who don't have disabilities mm -hmm. to kind of imagine, but they're quite happy with the lives that they have. And they're not searching for a fix or a cure. They are happy with who they are. They're happy with the life they have. Um, and that's not a place where they're putting the energy. So there's that as well, where you know, we're always supposed to be searching for a cure. We're supposed to be searching for a way to fix ourselves. I think that's period. Mm -hmm. That is our life that we live in because of like the effects of social media, the effects of like always like more and more and more improve capitalism, yeah. whatever. There's always something that could be fixed. And when you have a visible disability, people are going to be like, let's fix you. Yeah. Well, the thing is how many things have there ever been cures for? You know, there are things that we have eradicated to a certain degree, although that's a whole other issue right now, because some of them are making a comeback. Yeah, but, high measles. <laughs> yes. Whooping cough. Of, uh, my cousin's wife is pregnant, and she has to get a whooping cough um, vaccination, as well as anybody who's around her all the time, because it's making a comeback. And they do not tell pregnant women to get immunizations unless absolutely necessary. So... Yeah, there's there's things that have been controlled polio, you mm -hmm. know, there have been things that are being, like, kept at bay, but there's nothing that I can think of that has been cured. There are things that can be managed, there are things that medication can help, 
But do you know where my mind went? Where is that? I was like, what's been cured? And I was like, oh, erectile dysfunction. I'm like, no, that's more like been eradicated. Like it's still <laughs> like the one thing I could think of, which my mind went down that yeah. dirty hole. <laughs> was that? That's what popped up for you, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're so funny. <laughs> but, uh, well, and, and even that, that's if you can afford it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so that's the thing too is that, even when there are things that are out there, it doesn't mean that it's accessible to everybody. Yeah. Uh, and that's, and as someone who did the doctor dance for so long, I can tell you the medical system is not a place you want to stay. So I don't do a lot of medical appointments unless necessary anymore. I don't look for new medications. I don't, I do what I can, but as we talked about earlier, what doctors will say to you and how you're treated in the medical system. The medical system is not set up for the patients. The medical system is set up for medical professionals and that's a huge distinction mm -hmm. um, and we have a medical model of disability which is that model of the problem is us. The people who are disability are the things that need to be fixed as opposed to the social model of disability which is that if places were accessible the disability wouldn't matter. Um, and I like to say that there's there's people with disabilities and then there's enabled people. So everybody has access needs to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Some people have those access needs met and they're enabled. They're able to go about their daily life. Then there's other people whose access me needs are not met. And that's where we run up against things. And I mean, I recently went to an inclusive movements workshop, which was had not really considered people with disabilities at all and it was super frustrating because even in spaces where it seems like there should be inclusion understanding welcoming and it's just you know as soon as I went into the room I saw that it was a full circle of chairs with no spot left for me and they knew I was coming in a wheelchair and it starts with something as small as that where I, as soon as I went into the room, I thought, okay, this is not going to be accessible. Tell me more about this. What, like, what was this about? Because a, a place I teach, um, it, there are tons of physical restrict. Like I say, air quotes, but physical restrictions yeah. in terms of what people can be doing um, based on where they're at in their lives. Right. Um, and I'm like, how can I make this super accessible? Some people do chairs, some people are on the ground. Mm -hmm. Like, what does that look like? What What okay. did you feel? Well, I mean, tired. Yeah. <laughs> I felt tired because I had hoped, although I did go into it fully aware of the chance that it was not going to be inclusive to me because I'm so used to going to spaces that are not inclusive mm. to me. Um, and so for me, it's the default. And so I am used to it to a certain degree, but it makes me tired. And as soon as I rolled in, I saw that there was no space. I rolled out and I didn't go back in for the chit chat at the beginning. I just waited till it was started and then I went in and, and you know, moved. And this was actually the second I had gone to two different, one was on, um, one was on inclusion as well, although it wasn't called inclusive movements and it was about diversity and it was not set up accessible at all. It actually had an excellent um, description of the accessibility it was going to offer, but then when I got there, they didn't do anything that they had said in the course outline, and when I asked why, the facilitator said, oh, I didn't write it. <laughs> As facilitator, though, it's still that person's responsibility to yeah. either change what was written or to live up to what or make changes in the moment. Yeah, and so things like the fact that they were able to move a chair for me um, was something that could happen. But the fact that they had nuts in food that they said was going to be nut free could have killed someone because just being in a room with that. Mm -hmm. And that's why often people, even when we're told things are accessible, assume that it's not. And that stops people from going too. Um, so I saw something on Facebook the other day where a guy said he runs a, a course and he said that he had looked at the, opened the door, saw a grab bar in the washroom and so put down that it was accessible. And then when the person came to the course, it wasn't accessible. The toilet seat wasn't raised. There wasn't enough room for a wheelchair. 
And so don't say that something is accessible unless you actually know that it is. Um, because even when it says that it has a description of accessibility, we often don't believe it. Mm. And I, within my position with Citizens for Accessible Neighborhoods, put myself in that position because I want people who run these conferences and workshops to think about people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. But it's still exhausting. Yeah. Especially when it's supposed to be inclusive. I had higher hopes. <laughs> um, one thing is to never do a closed circle, to do a U, because a closed circle is never inviting. When you're talking with people and you make a closed circle, it doesn't make it seem like anybody can come up and join. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you always leave space, then it allows for people to work their way in who may be at different levels of social ability. And I think it's the same within rooms. You know, all they had to do was leave out two chairs. If by the time it started, those chairs were needed again, they could have put them right back in. But if people with mobility aids came, um, performative accessibility happened at the workshop. So that's where they realize that it's not accessible. They haven't set it up in accessible ways. And they go out of their way to try to, sorry, that's a medication alarm. Okay. Uh, and they go out of their way to to show that they're trying to be accessible. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. it's yeah. it's not that they're trying to address the accessibility, it's that they're trying to cover up the fact that they failed to include it in the first place. And so it's less about me and my needs and it's more about their need to show that they know what to do. And often what happens is they take my agency away, they take my independence away so uh, for example at one I went to they did not have a spot for myself and my mobility aid and they ran to the other end of the room and removed a chair and dragged it across the room and were like so sorry so sorry but I didn't want to sit where they <laughs> took the chair they didn't say um, first like of all do you need help moving a chair because trust me I've gotten very good at moving chairs <laughs> over the years and second of all, where would you like to sit? Um, and so, yeah, it's less about the person and it's more about them needing to kind of fix what shouldn't have happened in the first place. Yeah. Um, another big issue uh, with the inclusive movements one was uh, that we had multiple people there who had cognitive issues who throughout the day were saying that they had cognitive issues and were having issues with the way the instructions were presented and some of the activities and they were asking for clarification and they were asking for help and they were being ignored because there was someone in the room me with a visible disability that they were focused on mm. trying to correct the situation for that they completely ignored the people with invisible disabilities who were being very vocal and very honest about what their experience was. And then when they didn't come back the next day, the instructor said that it was probably because they couldn't handle the work, the intense work that we were doing, which could ruin careers or ruin reputations. Um, but it was to cover their discomfort at knowing that they had done something that had excluded people. And what was particularly frustrating in that instance was that these people were very articulate about what they needed mm. and that they, and they continually did say that they needed help because oftentimes people with disabilities won't say anything. Won't say right? anything. And one yeah. example, and if I can impress this on even one listener, then it's <laughs> been worth it, is that use microphones. Do not say, I can speak loud enough for everyone to hear. Don't make that assumption. If there's a microphone in the room, use it use it for everything use it for the questions in the audience or if you can't make it travel then repeat the questions from the audience into the microphone before answering them because i have been at so many meetings where there's someone at my table who has a hearing impairment and when they say is it okay if we don't use the microphone they don't want to single themselves out they don't want to become othered Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't say anything or somebody will say, um, and I was talking to a friend who works in unions and she's like, we are all very proud of our loud voices. So 
often at their meetings, they'll say, oh, I can speak loud enough, or I'm used to shouting, so everybody can hear me. Well, no, everybody can't hear you, and you've just, you know, taken away this person's ability to be as fully a participant as they can be. Um, and so, yeah, if there's a microphone, use it, uh, because you never know, excuse me, who does have a disability and who doesn't. Yeah. And often there are people who won't say they have a disability because either they don't identify as such or they don't want to single themselves out. Yeah. So, yeah, it's awareness. I mean, you know, there were a lot of things I was not aware of. How heavy doors are, for example. You know, when, when you don't have arthritis or something that makes it harder to, to deal with the heft, you don't really think about the heaviness of a door. You just open it. Uh, washrooms are a huge thing. There's so many inaccessible washrooms. Or just even look at the, the way the doors swing. There are yeah. so many accessible doors that open into the stall. But if I go into the stall with my wheelchair, I can't then shut the door. Right. And I can't tell you how many people who need assistance, so have an attendant who goes with them, who needs help getting into the washroom just gets used to life where the door is open because the attendant cannot fit into the washroom with them. Um, and that's where, you know, having universally accessible stalls or, you know, actual washrooms is so important. Not only is it important for people who are transgender or people who aren't sure which washroom to go into to feel safe, but it's important for people who have disabilities, have attendants. Uh, another big thing is there's an organization that's working hard to have the um, change tables in bathrooms be able to support an adult because there are people who go out with, uh, they have a disability and they have an attendant and they do need to be changed throughout the day mm. and there's no place to, to put them down and of course the, the uh, changing places that are provided just barely <laughs> have yeah. the weight you know the ability to handle the weight of a, of a child let alone an adult um, and so it's it's awareness of issues um, and it's a lot of different groups doing a lot of different awareness mm -hmm. um, and yeah it can seem overwhelming because there are so many people with disabilities but instead of that being overwhelming I think the kind of takeaway should be that there are so many people with disabilities. Yeah. You know, there's 20% of our population self-identify as uh, having a disability. And uh, so this really does affect a lot of people. And if we can just make some of these changes and, uh, you know, and a lot of them are not large when people think of accessibility improvements, they think of like ripping out the office and redoing the floor plan and, you know, things like that. And sometimes it's when you're at a meeting and, or a conference where there's lots and lots of tables, just making sure you always push your chair back in mm. so that someone in a chair doesn't have to kind of constantly be moving the, yeah. the chairs around. Yeah. So oftentimes it's not huge and it's not big and it's things like not having perfume and not having nuts and, and not having really bright lights or loud noises or um, and so yeah and if anybody cool. has any questions then definitely contact me um, and you can look online at our website at www.canvc.org uh, or email me at info at canvc.org. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm here to help. I'm here to answer questions. It's a learning process. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a learning process for me because I have a particular type of disability and therefore I need to learn about other types of disabilities because my lived experience is still very narrow when it comes to the overall umbrella of people with disabilities and so you know we're all learning and then there's the intersectionality right mm -hmm. so my experience as someone who I'm asexual and I'm non-binary and I have physical disability and that's very different than somebody who may be you know straight and black and deaf or somebody who has autism and is queer and so there's, you know, there's the intersections of, of, yes, it gets annoying to be asked about the, you know, what my health is or things like that. But then I talk to somebody who's black and they get the questions about their hair and where they're from, mm -hmm. as well as the disability and this and that. Or people from certain populations who, you know, people make assumptions about how they treat people with disabilities. So they get the questions about that, about does their family support them and 
these people don't even know who their family is. And yeah. So, yeah, you've got the intersections as well. And, uh, yeah, a couple of us have joked about making, like, a play where essentially we just have people of different populations kind of screaming out the different <laughs> microaggressions we've oh, Frank. done. Yeah, yeah, there was recently a show at the Roundhouse where it was at, well, it was an installation, and over a 24-hour period this artist had uh, written down a 1,001 uh, microaggressions and then put them up. Uh, she's racialized. And so it was interesting. You were supposed to read it, and you were supposed to answer one, and you were supposed to take one home to kind of like think about mm -hmm. uh and it you know this is just what she came up with in 24 hours and i think anybody who's from a population that's pushed to the margins you you can understand that because instantly you can think of of examples for so yourself much, right yeah uh, i mean i had i think the worst is i had a doctor who said to me why haven't you killed yourself yet that if okay that's said, unethical if i if i were you i would have jumped out of a window by now um, and so it's that where even within the medical community who is who we're supposed to be going for help, we have to run up against this brick wall of not knowing what disability is or what people with disabilities are aware of. And that's media. I mean, unfortunately, we very much have media representation where we're either victims or heroes. Yeah. And very little in between. So we love our Paralympic athletes. And often, unfortunately, people aren't focusing on the hard work and the dedication and the skill and the practice and everything they put into the sport, just that they're a person with a disability who's achieving something. Yeah. Um, and, and like you said, overcoming and being yeah, brave and all exactly, everything else. Exactly, inspirational. Yeah. Um, and then you have the, the media loves to do a story where, you know, someone with a disability is a victim and that, you know, we need to be taken care of and that uh, you know that we're so vulnerable and mm. you know there there are people in across the spectrum so it, we do have people who fit both of those but we have a lot of people that live in the middle and that's not talked about and it's very not often represented i mean the oscars just happened a couple of days ago and every time the oscar season comes along you just know there's going to be a movie about someone with a disability so that someone can try and get an oscar based on playing someone with a disability. And uh, it's, you know, a big issue about whether actors should play mm -hmm. someone with a disability, and I'm not completely against it, but I do think that there should be opportunities. First of all, all, all scripts that are about people with disabilities should have a disability consultant on it. Yeah. I think uh, Green Book is a good example of why you need someone. What's Green Book? Green Book was the one, the one that for some reason won the best picture this year and it's about a relationship between an Italian driver and uh, Dr. Uh, Shirley who was a piano player who's black and it was written by white people about a black man's experience. The family came out against it, there's been all sorts of horrible things about it and that was white people writing about a black person's experience. Mm. Bohemian Rhapsody I don't think anybody who was queer read that script. It, it um, again, was a, about an icon yeah. <laughs> of the bi and, and gay community. Um, and yet, there is so much in it that was gay is bad, straight is good. And it's the same with disability. You know, you see these movies and you think disability I mean there was a movie that just recently came out with uh, James McAvoy and he has split personality disorders oh yeah 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 and it's horrible because you just know anytime there's a disability they're not going to represent it properly they go to the extremes well wasn't that a horror movie as yes. well yes yeah and and then you know there's very little consultation with people who actually have disabilities there's um a great movie or tv show i think it's called speechless and it's about someone who has cerebral palsy and their teen and their family and it's written by a guy whose brother has cerebral palsy and his brother helped with it and the writers have cerebral palsy mm. and the person playing the kid with cerebral palsy has cerebral palsy and we need more opportunities because okay. it's not that there aren't actors out there with disabilities. It's that they're not getting the opportunities. Do you remember 
back in the 60s and 50s or even the old James Bond or Western Mm -hmm. movies if someone was indigenous it was played by a white man and just like have makeup drawn Bre- on. Yeah, or same breakfast with- at Tiffany's. The uh, um, oh yeah, Mister Fu. Yeah, or something Asian. And, yeah, and I um, and you know, having someone who's Japanese play someone yeah. who's Korean, or someone who's Thai play yeah. someone who's Chinese, or you're Middle Eastern. You'll do for the yeah, vibe person. Yeah, right. Yeah, or I mean, one that I watched so much as a kid and didn't even realize it was a white person playing the role was Short Circuit, which was about this. Oh yeah, robot. robot. I yeah. remember that one. And there's a white actor playing the um, the Southeast Asian in it. Oh yeah. yeah, and I mean, you know, to our to my family's ears, it seemed like oh okay. It is. You just didn't question it, right? And then, yeah, later I was like, oh my god, that was a white person. <laughs> and that's the thing. And I, I'm not a, adverse to it happening mm-hmm. because acting is acting. Um, what happens is, what what was the um, the movie with about uh, the astrophysicist um, who who was a Oh shoot! What was his name? Uh, Matt Damon. That's gonna no. The the actor was um, was British, and um, it was about oh what's his name? I have no idea. Yeah. Anyways, he was he was like a I think he was an astrophysicist, mm. uh, a world known scientist, and he had a disability. And Eddie Redmayne played him, Stephen Hawking. Okay, Stephen Hawking. In my mind, I was yeah. thinking an astronaut for some reason. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, what was that? Not a, so okay. it was Stephen Hawking, and it was Eddie Redmayne. Eddie Redmayne did an amazing job. Um, I'll give him that. But what happened was, and this is what always happens, is that there's a, was there was a scene in the movie, and I don't know why they had this, had to place this in the movie, but he is on stage giving a talk and a woman in the front row drops her pencil and he gets up out of his wheelchair walks down the stage and picks it up and of course it's a fantasy they do that when it's an actor playing someone with a disability they wouldn't do that if it was the person with a disability Mm. doing it uh there was a character in glee who was in a wheelchair. Right, and there was yeah. a whole episode where he was out dancing and doing everything he really wanted to do and be. So it's those kind of things where that wouldn't happen if it was someone who had a disability. And not everybody who has a disability dreams of not having that disability. Right. So it's how it's represented. It's like that is the only story we see again and again. If that was just one story out of the many. Because either... Disability movies are either somebody has a disability and they want to kill themselves and they either do or someone comes along and saves them. There there was a supposed romantic comedy recently of some rich guy who I think he became a quadriplegic and the woman who came and helped him fell in love with him but he died at the end of the movie and he was satisfied because he was leaving the money to her and she could live a good life. He was a like millionaire. He could have gotten the proper mobility aids. He could have gotten the proper care. He could have done all sorts of things as a person with a disability. I mean, I know people who have been bungee jumping in their wheelchairs. I know people who have been on zip lines in their wheelchairs, you know? Yeah. There is so much opportunity. I have flipped my power chair a couple of times because of places I've taken it. <laughs> <laughs> and I scared the crap out of people. I remember one time I was in Waterton. I was going through a uh, a field that had gopher holes in it and I got oh. caught and flipped over and there was a a tourist bus that was going by and I mean that bus broke so hard and these tourists just came running out to help this poor disabled person who'd fallen out and I was just laughing my head off and they didn't know what to make <laughs> yeah um but you know what that's the thing is that it's it's this focus on like the suffering and the hardship and the and yeah <laughs> Oh, Nikita <laughs> is, is saying hello. Hi, Nikita. But yeah, it's oh. it's understanding that you know it's it's not all bad. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Yeah. You know, it's it's. Every... It's not like oh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, and that's what we do get, you know, and it's yeah. the best thing. 
there is no person a- alive that doesn't have some sort of obstacle or barrier or something that they're having to work with in mm-hmm. life, whether it's financial or family or, you know, work or whatever it is. And so that's, yeah, definitely something that uh, we'd like to see more stories that represent Great. the wide range. Yeah. yeah. Is there, um, is there, we're almost at an hour and a half. Okay. Is there anything else that you'd want to leave listeners with? Well, one thing that uh, I'm working on right now yeah. is a, a board diversity project. And what we're trying to do is to have better representation um, because it is really important. And one of the things that uh, we've heard from quite a few of our members is they're tired of organizations that say they represent a certain population, mm. not having anyone from that population in positions of power. And that includes management, and that includes boards. Oh, she's coming to say hi. Hi. <laughs> um, and so we thought, well, how do we address this? And I like to, I like to assume that I don't know everything. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're really doing this project with a beginner's mind. Um, for six months, uh, we're trying to talk to as many people as possible, and that's people with board experience, without board experience, to find out what. Uh, how do we increase diversity? How do we make boardrooms accessible and inclusive and welcoming? And how do we help remove some of the barriers that preclude participation? Yeah. A, just a little cat, <laughs> cat tail on my A little cat tail. Hi. Yeah. Hi. And uh, so if you go to our website again, it's www.canbc.org. Um, we have the Board Diversity Project information right there on the page um, and we're just asking we're we're looking for research we're looking for information about how to make things more inclusive uh, orchestras in the states for example are doing they they discovered all of a sudden that the orchestras were very white and so how do we address this surprise surprise yeah. yeah so they have auditions where people take their shoes off behind stage and then they audition in front of a um like uh, not a barrier, but a, uh, a screen, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden there was more diversity. And the the taking of the shoes off behind stage is so you don't hear cowboy boots or high heels or sneakers mm. and start to already make judgments. Um, you know, and there's there's we've been talking with organizations who are already working on this, and one of the things that is really becoming clear is there's a lot of great people and a lot of great organizations working on trying to have more diversity uh, in boards and elsewhere in workplaces, but they're not sharing the information and we're not connecting. And so how do we help there? Um, and so we're looking for what are the ways that we can build capacity or better support people to help have that inclusion. Mm -hmm. And that's not just for people with disabilities, that's queer community, it's transgender, racialized, indigenous, uh, immigrants, uh, we've heard from some immigrants that uh, the countries that they come from do not have volunteer boards. It's strictly paid positions and it's strictly through connections, high level connections. So they don't even think to, to uh, mm. volunteer. Or because their technical skills have not transferred over well to Canada and have been devalued, they don't feel that their experience would be valued in volunteering either. So how do we address that? Um, and so there's lots of different conversations that we're having that are very exciting um, and if you'd like to participate we'd love to have you and uh, it's it's exciting because I think you know if we can connect some of these I think there's people who have figured out quite a bit of the picture but still have that those last couple pieces to find and maybe if we can get this group who has the last pieces and and connect them then that would be great because I think we all do better when we have better diversity and representation yeah absolutely because that's the thing I mean we can all have these conversations about our experiences as parents as people from certain populations whether it's disability or queer or even within the queer community we need to educate each other about what the different initials mean and the conversations between you know is bisexual pansexual and how are they different and who do they represent and what does it mean to the people who are of those populations and um, as someone who's asexual there's a lot of education to be done I mean when I go to these 
doctor's appointments and tell doctors that I have never had sex. They think that I'm lying, and then they assume that I'm lying about other things, and so mm. it has affected how they give me medical care. Um, and so it's, you know, trying to just get through <laughs> the world in our identities, and the more that we work together and the more we can have these conversations, and I appreciate you uh, being open to these conversations, then yeah. hopefully we can learn more, and then we can stop having to spend so much time on education and really get down to the, the nitty gritty of the projects that we're all working on. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, yeah. Heather. Um, you. Yeah, you've left links and emails yeah. and where people can contact you. Absolutely. Um, and then I'll also link on my website to Ken and um, the other work that you're doing. That would be great. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye.